Alexa, play Skyrim. Oh no! <laughs> oh, don't say that too loud. You'll hear your mind go off. I know. That's why I did it. <laughs> um, how's it going, Ken? We have Ken Hubble today, and we're talking about serious, serious fiction. And I will let Ken take it take take it away. All right. So, uh, so, uh, and ho hopefully everybody's having a great day today. Uh, you know, this, this whole virtual thing has been interesting. Um, and one of the reasons why, uh, serious fiction and, uh, and, uh, training from home and things like that are even more important than ever. So, um, so just to give you a little, uh, brief background on me, I've been in the learning and development space for more, more years and then more decades than I, than I want to uh, express. Uh, but I've also had the great opportunity to do some uh, work for some gaming companies uh, like uh, Virtus Corporation and uh, had a chance to do some neat things with uh, simulation and games for Caterpillar and NASA. And, um, you know, these are games you haven't seen before because they were done for specific corporations. And one of the things I really got into about uh, seven gosh, almost eight years ago now, um, is using, when, when the Alexa first came out, the first thing that, that crossed my mind was uh, create a uh, Star Trek uh, uh, captain's log. And uh, so I did. And, uh, and then I said, hmm, how could we use this for learning? And how could we use this for training? And that's when I got down the path of doing uh, performance support, audio-based, hands-free performance support using Alexa. Um, then uh, the team at AWS uh, came out with, and Amazon came out with the earbuds, which made it even better. Uh, you can now do it on your phone, and, uh, and that's exciting. And so um, one of the challenges, though, behind all of it is the authoring side. Uh, because writing Alexa skills, while it is, um, you know, it, it is fairly straightforward, um, trying to add additional content and, uh, and, and make it truly interactive um, is a challenge, uh, especially for those who don't code uh, naturally in Node or, uh, or in JavaScript or uh, Python. And, um, and don't want to have to deal with the whole complexity of, constantly updating a skill uh, to add content. So one of the things I set out to do was uh, to create a serious fiction engine, uh, a way of doing serious fiction uh, for the masses. And, uh, and I also felt like, um, you know, this is something that uh, will really help uh, organizations uh, be able to do soft skills. Uh, like uh, th that are conversational based because you need to be able to have voice. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to show some slides. We're going to talk about some stuff and then uh, I'll, I'll point you in the direction of, of, of the demos and hopefully we'll have time. I'll, I'll be able to, to uh, show how this whole thing comes together. So um, so serious fiction is, is, is all about, uh, you know, creating a conversation uh, and it's about telling stories. And so, uh, so, you know, as, as I was saying, you know, my background is I, I've created uh, serious fiction games for uh, teaching mathematics to high school students. Uh, I've done simulations and interactive video uh, for a variety of companies. And, uh, and that all kind of spun around um, back in, I think it was 2013, um, when science fiction became science fact. And uh, what we thought of as, uh, you know, future forward thinking uh, with HAL uh, back in 2001, uh, Space Odyssey, for those of you who haven't seen, uh, seen the movie, uh, it's now Alexa. I mean, and, and, and so, uh, and creepily so sometimes, uh, as she, said, as she uh, talks to you and, and, and learns things about you that you never wanted her to know in the first place. And so... Let's talk about what interactive fiction is. So inter interactive fiction um, dates back a long, long time ago uh, for, for you know, all you newbies that are out there uh, and even some of the, the slightly older folks uh, that uh, never got a chance to play text-based adventure games um, like Adventure or Colossal Cave or Lost Pig. 
Um, they're, they're, they're fun little games. Um, they have multiple branching. You can wander around mazes and, and accomplish tasks. And, but it was all done by typing into a console. Um, subsequent to then, uh, some folks have taken those original uh, interactive fiction engines and brought them into the era of web uh, uh, playback and web deployment and added the ability to put graphics and, and, and nice uh, CSS tags and things like that to make the, the adventure a little bit more visually appealing. But the, the, the guts of it is roughly the same. You're providing opportunity for people to make decisions and based upon those decisions, the game system does something. It, it, it interacts and, and, and it takes you, you know, to different rooms or different situations um, and lets you explore and make, you know, and, and learn things. Uh, in the case of the games, it's learning how to conquer the level. Uh, in the case of this Adventures in Mathematics course I did, um, it was a way of taking quadratic equations <laughs> and, and making it interesting to a bunch of high school students that, you know, with the rare exception, really didn't care and didn't really understand the practical applications of the things that they were learning by rote memorization. And, um, and so by putting it in this adventure, uh, we found that uh, we could teach quadratic equations and make it interesting and uh, with a marketed increase of uh, competency of the students. And so those who took the, uh, the, the game uh, actually had a, a score somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% higher or more competent in the subject than those who did not. Um, and so that was kind of the, and we had, we had control groups and we did the, the, the testing and uh, in one of the counties in North Carolina. And, uh, and it was really kind of fun. And so, um, you know, in this case, uh, we had some different challenges they would get along the way. Um, they explored the quad, which was this made up land that I, I, I came up with. And, um, and they had to learn first what the equation was, what the quadratic equation was, and then how to apply it. And then uh, throughout, they had opportunity to see graphic representations of how things were working, and they could continue to make choices until they eventually won the game. And they received points. So if you, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it says you received the linking badge. So there were badges. That was the gamification part of the whole thing. And then there was actually scoring based upon how well you resolved the situations that you were faced with throughout the game. So that was my real first deep dive into creating my my own interactive fiction and that was several years prior to me getting a hold of the alexa and then uh and then once the alexa came out i was like why am i typing all this stuff and so that takes us into the next part of this um so you know part of the interactive fiction is uh is the art of of creating the adventure itself so there's something called the 3C model. I wish I could say I invented it, um, but it's been around for, for a while now. Um, and it all deals with challenge, choice, and consequences. And whether it's a, a, a game like Mario Brothers or whether it's an interactive fiction game, um, it, it, it's all about presenting someone in a, uh, putting someone in a situation where they, they have some level of challenge, uh, they have to make a choice, and then there's a consequence to whatever that they did. And the same thing applies to business and, 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 and to, uh, you know, other forms, you know, other areas of education, um, you know, in, in the business world or in the high school world or college world, you know, we're constantly faced with challenges. Um, we have to make choices, whether it's, you know, what to do on a Friday night or, you know, how to invest your money. Um, and then there's a consequence usually associated with that. You know, you drink too much uh, on a Friday night, uh, you might not make it home safely. Um, you drink too much when you're going to invest, you might lose all your money. Um, but, you know, but there's, there, there are these choices and these consequences. Um, and in the case of things like context-centered training, uh, for example, uh, something that is primarily a social engagement where there's a dialogue going on and what you're talking about, whether it's sales or whether it's help desk support, um, you're, you're, you're 
having a conversation with someone and based upon how you have that conversation, you may resolve someone's problem or someone's situation. You may make a sale or you may have, you know, or, or you may lose a sale and, and there are definite consequences to those things. Uh, you may have a customer that gets agitated and, you know, and your job is to de-escalate the agitation by how you communicate with that person. Now, typing it in is okay. Uh, providing multiple choice answers is okay, but wouldn't it be better if you could actually have a dialogue, a, a, a verbal dialogue? And that's where the whole uh, concept of using natural language processing and the Alexa uh, came into being uh, for the for the work that I was doing. So, how do you get there? How do you how do you lay this out to where it makes sense? Well, one of the things you have to do first is figure out what it is at the end of the day that the learner has to do. Now this is this is instructional design. This is this is some some fairly straightforward, well uh, modeled, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, rules of of generating learning and training content. It is okay. I I have someone. They have a gap that that uh, in their knowledge or their skills or their behaviors, and I have to figure out how to get that gap solved. Um, and, and one of the things that happens in uh, traditional e-learning or traditional training materials is that, you know, oftentimes we do a big data dump as far as the environment, who the characters are, blah, 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 blah. And, and we don't give them the opportunity to actually experience life and experience a situation like you would if you were really talking to someone on the phone for the first time. Uh, or you were really interacting with them at, um, you know, at a sales desk or something like that. And so one of the, one of the advantages to, uh, to interactive fiction where you're allowing them to pretty much free form um, their answers uh, is that you don't have to do that dump all at once. And you can let the, the learner ask the questions that they should be asking to extract that information from the characters that are involved. Or they can look around the environment and learn about what tools, what, what the situation looks like in wherever they are uh, to help them learn how to determine uh, you know, what the situation is and then apply their knowledge of how should I take care of this? How should I resolve this situation? Um, in some cases, you can actually teach while you're doing that and actually fill in the gap. Some of uh, some of these situations, there is some pre-work that must that has to be done, depending upon whether there are policies and procedures that that they need to know before they get started. Um, but the idea is to let them explore and experience and discover this information. Uh, and that goes down to where I talk about descriptions and not dictionaries. You know, the worst thing in the world you can do to a learner is say, here's a bunch of terms, memorize these, and not let them actually discover them like they would if they were, you know, out, you know, out, out and about in their normal life. The other thing is you, you, there was a tendency in, in some of the early interactive fiction games and even in e-learning where there's a yes or a no answer. But in real life, sometimes there's yes, no, and it just doesn't matter. It, it's not applicable, but you still have to make that choice. And so, you know, one of the things that I like to promote in, in, in the work I do is, is having that third choice, even in a multiple choice question where uh, someone has, you know, one or two right answers and a couple of wrong answers, very seldom do we get this not applicable part, the neutral answer. And so if you can provide that and then provide the logic around why they made that answer, um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a more natural experience. And then on top of everything, we either want a feedback that is a consequence you know, you lost the deal, somebody walks out, the person gets angry and slams the phone down, whatever that case might be. Or there's that plus coaching. So it is, it's not that you totally failed, but there's a teaching moment where, uh, you know, some character, some 
aspect of your your game your 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 story allows you to provide a third person coach to come in and say hey you know i noticed that you were struggling with this did you consider this now you let them make the decision first but then once they've made the decision based upon what they do you may either catch them before it's executed or you may just provide that that coaching behind it but because of the way interactive fiction works you can do that in a very non-linear approach it doesn't have to be one path and that's it and you're always going to get the information you may be able to take lots of different paths in an interactive fiction story and sometimes you'll fail and sometimes you'll succeed and sometimes you may fail a little bit and then get back on track depending upon whether you can rectify the situation either through coaching or through just recognizing the consequences and doing a course correction um, a lot of that has to do with just the way you structure your interactive fiction game so so what is what 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 was and what is interactive fiction when you look at the guts of it well in interactive fiction you have um, a situation or a game or something and i'm looking here let's see look at those woodchucks yeah um so so you're you're looking at a at a, at a scenario and these these games the interactive fiction games if you've never played one <clears throat> There is a, a site called ifarchive.org, um, and it is great. It has lots of games. It has players that you can use to play those games. You don't have to have a, uh, you know, a, a, a console or anything like that. And uh, some of them will actually play over the web. And so if you get a chance to try them out, they're fun. Uh, there's some that actually work on iPads. And um, if you do a search on, on, on uh, apps for your iPad, there's one that actually has a whole library of the games that are out there that are available. Um, and you can go to Alexa and uh, say, Alexa, open head games. And that was my initial uh, uh, attempt at and, and success to some degree um, at adding natural language processing to uh, interactive fiction games, and I've got a handful of the games you know, linked to the to to the skill. Um, I'm now working on one called Serious Fiction, and uh, and it is geared towards you being able to create your own games and uh, keep the inventory, and you can then share them with your friends or your company, and uh, and and associated things like that. Um, but the key behind the interactive fiction in the early days was that it was very specific. Um, you start the game, there's a handful of commands that you can use. Um, I shouldn't say handful, there's a lot of them. But, uh, and they vary from game to game, but there's a core set. And based upon that core set, you could do things like talk to someone or ask someone about something. Uh, you could pick up an object. You could put an, put an object down or drop it. Um, you could walk in uh, geographic directions of north, south, east, west, northeast. You know, you, you know the drill. Um, one of the things that um, was the challenge in all this is that you had to figure out exactly what it was that you were supposed to type in, and uh, and and make it you know and make it actually achieve the effect that you wanted to have it achieve. And then on top of that, you had to uh, make sure you spelled everything correctly. Um, and, and sometimes you had to use the right word combinations because uh, if there was a white house and they specifically wanted you to type in white house and not the blue house that's next to it, um, it, might not if you just type in the word house it might get confused or it might ask you which one and if you haven't seen the blue house yet then you might not know to type that in and um, there were all sorts of challenges to it that made the adventure not just uh challenging from the puzzles and the types of things that you were experiencing but just in the interface itself not to mention the fact that typing all that stuff gets old and uh, especially if you get stuck in a puzzle that you've got to do over and over again. So again, 
know, that was that was what I was looking at. Now, I will also note that there's a, a, a piece of software, and I'll talk about a little bit more later, called Inform, and it's on version 7 now. Uh, it's open source. Um, it is readily available. It is a great authoring tool. Um, and we'll talk about it some more, but that's the, that's the tool that I was using and have been using to write the interactive fiction. Um, this little graphic is available. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's HTTP colon slash slash PR dash IF dot org. Um, I don't know if they're going to share these decks or not at the end of this whole thing, but, um, important thing though, is that, you know, cheat sheets like this are out there. And it does make it easier, at least when you're first getting started. Um, oh, yeah, let's see. Will an archive of the stream be available? Um, I hope so. Um, I don't know yet. Um, questions. How do you best handle typos? Ah, okay. So I'm going to talk about that in just a second as far as the typos and the regional variations because you can put alternative words to look for. And so, uh, so that's one way. <clears throat> um, and then there's some other things that I haven't fully fleshed out with on the natural language par uh, parsing side of things, where uh, because the Alexa devices can be set for uh, uh, different languages, um, like uh, British English versus American English, where you got S's versus Z's and all sorts of funky things like that that happen. Um, you can put alternative uh, interpretations of the spellings and have it chunk it out as the thing you want it to be. And I'll talk about that you know, in just a couple of seconds. Oops. So, um, so why in the world do natural language processing anyway? It's, 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 it's added code. It's, it's an additional interface. What is it, what is, what is it that makes it special? Well, <clears throat> Um, the average person can type 40 words per minute. They can speak 100 to 150 words per minute. Uh, they can read 200 words a minute, and they can listen to 400 plus words a minute. Um, and speaking and hearing do not require the ability to read and write. So for kids or for folks where English is a second language, for example, and they may know how to say it, they might not know how to spell it. Well, the fun part is, is that Natural language processing, presuming you can understand the accents, um, does a really great job of spelling for you. And uh, with the exception of, um, I was trying to put the name of a dog in, and in the area where I live in Raleigh, um, there's a place called Fido, which is a French spelling of Fido. Um, and it was like a takeoff for a, a, a dog bakery where, where they make you know, uh, biscuits and things like that. And so I kept saying Fido, meaning F-I-D-O, and they kept spelling it P-H-Y-D-E-U-X or something like that. Um, needless to say, I had to put an alternative spelling in there, and uh, and then it worked. So, uh, so you know, let's see. Do you know? Oh, uh, all right. Um Let's see. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for just a second because I've just thrown out a whole bunch of stuff about you know NLP and and earlier games. If anybody's got any questions, I can I can squeeze a question or two in here right now, or we can just keep going. Um, oh, let's see. What are some currently available skills you think exemplify high quality interactive fiction skills training or both? Um, so head games. Uh, that's the one I did. Uh, it's great because it has lots of the original games uh, tied into it. I added the ability to let it have hints. Uh, you can save your spot uh, and some things like that. Um, so that's, that's one. I'm working on a skills training version of the same thing. Um, and then there are some really neat West, uh, Westworld had uh, a game. I don't know if it's still out. It was really good. Uh, Skyrim's got one that's pretty good. Um, but as far as the uh, the old the old time games, uh, I think mine is one of the few that's out there that actually works. Um, 
So, um, so that's, that's what we got. We can do all the questions. Yep. And we'll get the questions at the end here. So let's keep on trucking. So how did we do this? How did, how did I take this idea and make it happen? So first of all, I needed a natural language processing system and lo and behold, Alexa appeared and all was good. Well, it was a struggle in the beginning, but it got better. And now it's really nice. Um, in order to get Alexa to actually be able to do what I wanted to do, I had to create a dialogue model. And I'm going to look, we'll look at this in just a minute, but a dialogue model tells Alexa how to interpret what it is that I, you know, that, that, that the player is saying. Uh, and then it does its AI and machine learning magic on the background and interprets it all and understands all the dialects, et cetera, et cetera. And that information then gets passed on to the content engine. Now, the content engine actually is not Alexa. It is a Node.js set of files uh, that I created. Uh, I'm all, I created some of it. Some of it, I used the open source Z machine, which is a, an interpreter. Uh, it's, a, it's a virtual machine uh, that... Uh, is used for uh, interactive fiction games. Um, and so I took that engine, the open source code for it, uh, modified it so that it could take in the data from Alexa in a way that allowed Alexa to actually function. Uh, when I first tried doing it, um, it would receive the information, but then Alexa would crap out and I couldn't figure out why for a while. And then, and then I figured it out. So long, long story short, it became the content engine that's sitting in the background. Um, and it has a custom database and it has uh, the ability to, to interpret the Z machine files that inform creates. And then uh, the inform tool is how I create the logic and the rules and the gameplay that feeds into this. The great thing is that I separated the authoring and the storytelling system from the natural language processing and console, if you want to call it system, which is Alexa. And because of that, non-programmers of the, of, of the kind that you have to be in order to do Alexa skills um, could actually develop content and can actually write content for interactive fiction. Um, so, so what does this all look like? So in Alexa land, uh, it has uh, Alexa has what they what, what they call the Alexa Dev Console, and we're gonna we're gonna look at this real quick. I'm gonna switch screens here, and hopefully it's not gonna spaz out on me. And um, and I'm gonna play through a couple of seconds of the Series Fiction Engine, and then um, and then we'll come back to to walking through the the paces. So we got this to work earlier today, so we're gonna hope that it still does it. There we go. All right. So, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to run the demo first and then we're going to talk about it. So, um, I have some utilities in here to allow me to have some, some pre, pre-filled in, uh, dialogue and, uh, we'll, we'll make sure this thing flows. So what it's doing right now is it's loading the skill into the test simulator. And then welcome to serious fiction. Are you ready to take a course? Navigate to our list of available courses by saying first, next, previous, or last. Say describe to learn more about the course. Course two of two, Granite Contact Center Training. So it's loading the course right now. Still loading. Welcome to Granite Contact Center Training. After each response from the course, you will hear this tone. And you have eight seconds or so to say a command or action or ask for help. Let's begin. Welcome to the Contact Center, where we don't take you for granted. How can we help you with your tech rock? So, um, so one of the things I'm going to show here is that they, there is a, there is a visual display component to Alexa now. And so if you have an Alexa show or you have a fire TV or 
Uh, you have one of the little uh, echo devices that sits on your, your countertop. Um, if you design it with the visuals involved, it will actually display it as well. Now, the great thing is that you, that means you get the display and the read back, but you can still use your voice to interface with the device. And they're doing something now on the mobile devices where you can actually type in your answers. So if you were in a quiet environment and you couldn't use your voice, you could still type in your answers. And I haven't gotten, I haven't implemented that part quite yet, but the idea is that you can do that. So, um, so this, this is a, a, a context center training. This is you playing the customer and, um, and, and learning from an expert how to do the, how to, how to, how to do your, your job. And so let's, um, let's learn about obedience because you got to have obedience if you're going to have a pet rock. Obedience training. Nobody, but nobody likes a silly misbehaving rock. Therefore, it is most important that you begin training immediately. Your pet rock should be made to know who is the boss and that you will demand certain good manners and impeccable behavior if the two of you are to have a happy, well-adjusted relationship. Pet rocks should be able to come here, sit, stay, and down. So parts of this that differentiate. So the content is coming from the interactive fiction file, the, the interactive fiction course that I created. The interface, including the little bell sound, uh, the female voice, that's all Alexa. That's the Alexa commands and the Alexa things that are going on. The guy's voice I used for the train, the, 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 the actual training content. You can, there's, there's somewhere around 21 different voices you can pick from. Uh, and now I think they've, well, they've, they've added some other ones I haven't implemented yet. One of them is Samuel L. Jackson. So um, at some point, I'm going to figure out how to use his voice in one of mine just because it'd be fun. And, um, oh, and the punishing gets worse. Once, if, if we were to go through this whole thing, I got a little bit ridiculous. But um, the, the important thing is that you can, you can put this kind of uh, information in here. So if, if we were to you know, choose sit, for example. This is not a difficult command to teach a pet rock as most rocks spend the bulk of their time sitting in now, anyway. However, a refresher course is certainly in order since you will want to. So I'm going to say no, it didn't learn how to sit when I said it. Um, Submit a ticket. And in, in, in the case of the contact center, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do after you've trained it, uh, it the system tells you to submit a ticket. And then I can come over here and say submit. And now, no, I'm only typing the word submit. I could type in submit a ticket. I could type in ticket and it would still understand it going back to, uh, I think, J Jennifer's question about, you know, uh, words, you know, and, and things like that. So if I type in submit. Sounds like you are stuck between a rock and a hard place. We have submitted a ticket for your pet rock. Please allow 24 hours for our emergency staff to contact you via email. Okay, so that's the gist of how the, the dialogue, the communication goes back and forth. I'm going to go back to the presentation here and we'll walk through uh, some of the how. So Alexa, ha, you know, in the console uh, gives you the ability to, to lay out your interaction model your dialogue model. Um, and they, and it consists of what they call intents. And that is, uh, what I'm intending to do based upon what I say. And, um, there are some options in this to, to be able to purchase, uh, and license the use of this series fiction engine once I get it done. Um, and it will consist of either a purchase phrase standalone or a purchase phrase and a product. And so I can specify which of the products that I want to have it do. Um, and the whole thing here, this whole block of, of information is what they call an utterance. So there's an intent. I intended to do something. Um, and that intent maps to the, the, the node.js code uh, or endpoint uh, that, that I have set up. And then, um, and then each one of these things, the purchase phrase or the product, um, is, is what we call a slot. And so the slot, 
is slots of values. So there's lots of them. So um, I'm not sure who asked it earlier, but for the term save, so you can save your position in the course. Um, I have saved my game, save this game, save game, save this course, bookmark this course, yada, yada, yada. So I have lots of ways of doing it. And some of these are spelling variations. So one of the things I found out is that when you try to say the word sit, sometimes it sounds like set. Set and sit are two different words. Uh, because I wanted it to work no matter what, I put both of those terms as terms that I would accept for the word sit. Now, I didn't do that here in the Alexa side of things, though. I did that on the authoring side of the story. So there's two buckets. The way I segmented this was that anything that was part of the bigger shell, the, the natural language processing of how to communicate with the course and how to do utilitarian things like help and, um, and what commands are available and uh, save and quit and those things, those are all handled uh, and even even selecting the the, uh, the the specific course um, that you wanted to take uh, through the navigation of first, uh, next, previous, last kind of controls to cycle through umpteen courses that might be available. That's all handled by the Alexa side. Anything that is content related to the game is handled by the authoring side. And so... Um, and just to dive into the node side just for a second. So um, I don't know how well you can see this, but in the source folder that I have here, and I use Sublime uh, to do my coding, um, there's an app file, and then there's a bunch of associated utility files that are associated with the game. The app file is the core file that you use to create your, your endpoint code. And this is code that resides uh, in Lambda on AWS's server. Uh, you can also host it other places, but the easiest is just just do that. Use the Amazon Web Server, um, and it's the it's the thing. The endpoint is a thing that Alexa communicates with. It sends information to the endpoint, and it receives information back from the endpoint in the in in, in the context of uh, what it's supposed to say. And, uh, and, and then you know, the, the path that it's taking. Uh, I'm not going to dive deep dive in this. There's plenty of tutorials out there. But I wanted you to know that that's what I'm doing here. It's not, there's, there's not a, 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 a magical thing taking care, uh, playing out there. The other thing you can do, and this is the one thing I did want to point out, is there's a way of setting up locales for the languages it will interpret. So I've got mine set to only take languages that are uh, English US, English Great Britain, uh, English Ger or, um, uh, German, and Japanese. Those are the languages I have it set to take right now. Um, I haven't quite got the German and the Japanese working yet. That's a different story. But my goal is to have that working, mainly because they tend to be the largest markets for this uh, this kind of stuff. Um, but there are 21 of these now that you can use. And I think that's, I think it, they've added a few more recently. So, um, but the endpoint is what you create there. There's all sorts of different ways of writing the endpoints, but the important part to know is that that's the, that's the pivot point that goes back and forth where you, uh, exchange data. All right. So once you write your endpoint, you want to load it into, uh, AWS. Uh, in their function, their Lambda functions uh, area, you create this, you connect the dots, and uh, and away you go. The the key things here, uh, a lot of folks get stuck on this to begin with, is that you have to actually put the Alexa Skills Kit as one of the um, triggers uh, to to be a part of this. Um, if you use a custom database, uh, it adds uh, it, it's a destination that gets tied into here as well. I I figured out how to use Google spreadsheets to do a lot of the data work that I'm doing just to make it easier for my end users to put things like list of courses and uh, uh, email addresses and other things um, rather than trying to have them 
you know, create a separate database interface through a web page. Um, so, um, so that's that's uh, that's the function side of it. Um, and then here's the here's here's the guts of the story. So, Inform Seven, it's a free application. Just do a search on Inform Seven. It's uh, it's in, it's it's an interesting language. It reminds me of uh, a programming language I used years ago called Lingo, which was a part of Macromedia Director before it became Adobe Director and then was shelved. Um, but it's a very verbose language. And when I mean verbose, I mean the language, when you first look at it, you're like, is this code? Uh, and it actually is. It's using verbose text to describe properties and values and things like that. So, for example, um, uh, there's things like, you know, instead of an init or a main file uh, or, 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 or function, there's when play begins. That's actually a main. And it kicks off and it tells you, you, there's a, you can put a whole bunch of stuff underneath it that tells it what to do when the game begins or when play begins. Um, there's things like um, the object context center is actually a location in this virtual uh, interactive fiction world. <clears throat> and it is a room. So it has a room property or, and, 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 uh, and it has a description, which is another property of the contact center once you create it. Um, the pet rock, um, I, f I, I chose to actually make it something even though I hid it because there are properties about the pet rock I wanted to be able to pull from later. Um, like giving it alternative names. So if I was to have called my pet rock um, pet, you know, how do I teach my pet to do something? Or how do I teach my rock? Um, then it would have understood that. Um, it would have understood that, you know, it, it knows that a pet rock is an animal. So therefore it has animal characteristics. Um so, so there's a lot of things in here. As you read through it, you're like, that's a lot of words to do what we could do like in JavaScript or something like that really quickly and easily. Where it becomes very advantageous is when a non-programmer is doing this and they're used to writing stories and they're used to describing things in terms uh, that are not uh, curly brackets and parentheses and things like that. Um, I will tell you, I, I, I learned in form, uh, and I'm still learning it. There's, it's, it's, it's quite large. It's been developed over a long period of time. Um, I learned it over a weekend, and I'm still evolving my, uh, my, my, my repertoire in it. I have figured out how to get it to react more code-like because that's just the way I think in some terms. But the great thing is I can go back and forth between my code-like structures like if you look down here, after reading a command, that means after interpreting what is typed or said out loud, um, do something. So in this case, you know, if the player's command matches the regular expression look or examine, so going back to your multiple words fa uh, facet of things, I wanted it to be able to interpret the word look and the, the word examine the same way. And a matter of fact, I put a, a little asterisk after each one of these because if I say, uh, look, at do, uh, look at my rock or, you know, look at uh, or examine um, the condition of my rock, it ignores the balance of it and is just looking for the word examine. And so you could, you could allow someone to be able to say a lot of things and it ignores everything but the keyword that it's looking for. That makes it much easier to have a conversation when you can throw away the extraneous stuff. Now, you might say, well, Alexa can do that anyway. Why did you do it here? And the reason why I do it here is, A, it ties that information more closely to the content of the or the story. But it also means I don't have to hard code it in the skill. I can hard I can hard code it into the the story, and if the story ever changes as I'm writing it, I don't have to keep going back and recompiling the Alexa skill to get it to work. 
So, um, so there's, there's, there's a code side of it. And if you look at the interface here, there's code on this side and then the playback over here. So if you, and you can continuously test this, this is, this is a, uh, a runtime, you know, comp compiler. So it, it, it does the comp compiling and then you're able to play out exactly what you would be doing. Now you have to type it in, uh, in, in the inform software. Um, but if you set yourself up a nice pattern for being able to test verbally, you can do that too. Um, once you get it into the Alexa arena. So um, the cool thing about Inform is it generates things like this, this little tree diagram that lets you see the path of your conversation and how users might be using it. Um, that's called the Skyne. Um, and it has a set of indices. Now, I kept this particular scene pretty simple. Um, you know, there's the contact center, and then there's the obedience training, the uh, skills training, and the health uh, healthcare. Um, but that could have been a much more complicated sequence of, of rooms and, uh, and spaces where conversations could take place. And, uh, and, and, and that opens up the doors to a lot of things like orientation training, or, you know, imagine if you've got earbuds in and you're walking through uh, a building for the first time. And you can say, hey, I'm in the whatever room. Uh, where can I go? And it might say, you know, you can go to the lunchroom that's in front of you. You can go to the offices to the right of you. The reception desk is to the left of you, blah, 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 blah. So there's, there's all sorts of, of, of potential for how this could be used, especially in a hands-free environment, because you've got earbuds that allow you to communicate with Alexa using your voice. So... The last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to open the floor for questions, is um, the great thing about being able to do this on your mobile device um, is that you can test, 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 um, and it gives you transcripts. So in the Alexa app, uh, when you fire it off and, and, and get it running, you're able to voice communicate with it here. Um, it tracks the activity and it tracks everything that's being uh, sent back to the user, as well as if you click the more button here, it tells you what the person said. So you can start looking for words that it doesn't quite understand well. Um, I, I had one that I was trying to say the word lock and it kept interpreting as log. And so I was able to put that in there. Um, and then under the voice history, it gives you a full history of everything that's ever said to the Alexa device. And so you can track and make sure, again, is it understanding the words you're using correctly? So, um, so that's it. Uh, my, my, my company that I use to do, um, you know, the Alexa skills and things like that is Wish and a Prayer Studio. Uh, contact information is there. Feel free to reach out to me. And I think we got time for a few questions or a couple of questions. I'm not sure, Jay. Yeah, we've got time for a few. All so right. we already did a couple of them because you touched on the um, typos, pronunciations, and, and regional variations, and how do you get Alexa to understand Southern English? Correct. <laughs> yeah, and I've got I you know I I I don't have as strong of a Southern accent, but my kids do, and well, uh, and it's it's great. <laughs> That's that's Jennifer's question. I mean, can you do accent recognition with the NLP as an example? An NPC responding differently if the player has a formal versus casual accent, local or elsewhere. Um, so, th so there's two approaches to this. Um, there's build it into the skill itself, and again, you have to put variants. So, have people in the test audience or in the in, in the locale go through a a, a set of expected responses or expected answers and it'll grow and then once you have that you can import that into the alexa skill uh to have it interpret it if it's specific to the game content again you just have to take those words and the spellings and put it into it like if your character goes out to the country npc oh 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 so um not that mine does it but in the alexa skill if they have registered as a user for that skill, and they've 
They've allowed for you to know the geographic information um, on their phone uh, or on the device itself. As long as the device or the phone is with you, it knows where you are geographically. And then you can say, based upon my geography, change the way that the, that the, that the, the, the Node.js code is interpreting the information. So change how the endpoint is interpreting the information. So yes, you can, but it, 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 it does take a little bit of work. So CJ has a question. Why yeah. do you think Germany and Japan are the major markets for this sort of experience? And what are your thoughts on how best to grow awareness elsewhere? Um, so it wasn't that Germany and Japan were major markets for the interactive fiction so much as it's a, that was a, a copy paste from other skills I've done and, uh, and they were for those skills. So, um, so I neglected to actually take them out of my list. Uh, as far as growing awareness elsewhere, that is a challenge that all of the skill developers go through right now because there's like a hundred thousand skills out there now. And, and, and it's just, you know, you're just flooded. The best thing I can say is make presentations at, at, at conferences like this, uh, go to user groups. My Star Trek one, for example, I went out to the Star Trek Facebook users group or whatever, and I put it out there. I've got an Instagram site now. My daughter helped me set up because I don't Instagram, but she does. And so she's got my Star Trek skill out there doing that. And um, and what's, what's, what's fun, I mean, you're... I'd love to say you're going to make a million dollars on this. I make enough money off of my skills that it pays for all my streaming services at home and a little bit more. <laughs> so, so my goal is to break even with Amazon Prime and a little bit extra. <laughs> so the next one from Gabriella, what coding prereqs do you recommend having? Okay, so for the Alexa skill development, JavaScript, 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 or you can use Python, but there's more JavaScript examples than there are Python. Um, and uh, for the uh, the story authoring, um, if you have a general understanding of the structures of code, like you know uh, if then statements and uh, and just you know uh, logically grouping. Um, events and actions and things like that um, you'll do well um, if you if you if you're just starting off in code you'll probably do well because you've got nothing to have to forget <laughs> and so you'll just read through the tutorials and the 300 page manual that comes along with it and uh, and and I, I highly recommend start at the beginning of the manual and go through it don't skip any steps because there's lots of stuff in it Oh, if anyone else has any questions, pop them in here real quick. We've still got a couple of minutes. Otherwise, we're going to take a little break. And then Dan is going to be back with Toya on her narrative talk. The Make sure you're still checking out the career, the career area. It has been very lively over there. Uh, all of us discovered that if you turn off video sharing, we can have 70 some people in those sessions. And so that, that's been a nice little perk. Um, <laughs> and also we've got, you know, the art competition, the indie showcase, all kinds of stuff going on on the discord. It's www. No, it's not. It's discord.gg slash indie game business. And it's all linked from within me to match. So you should be able to find it. Um, Ken, this is, this is fantastic. Very interesting. Uh, my question is, for those of us who can't code, is there an option to build these skills? Is there anything out there that we can use to build these skills without knowing how to actually code? All right. So if you want to create a trivia game, if you want to create a very simple interaction, um, you know, there are some great tutorials out there and, and, and Alex or, or, or Amazon has provided some utilities to make it a little easier to do these kind of dialogue flows, um, and, 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 and exchanges, uh, some which kind of fill in the blank. There are some other tools. So one of the tools I use is out by Jovo tech. That's J O V O T E C H. Um, it's a programming framework in JavaScript. Um, it does simplify the coding in JavaScript far easier than the pure 
out of the box Alexa coding, which is a nightmare sometimes. And uh, so, so, uh, and and as as changes happen on the Amazon side, Jovotech is kind of filtering it so that we don't see the changes behind the scenes. Our code just stays going. The other thing I'll say about Jovotech is that um, with some finessing, you can get the same code to work for Google Home as you get to work for the Amazon device. I just think the Amazon device from a, a development standpoint is much easier than the Google device and cheaper. Is there a a third player coming into this market other than Amazon and Google? Oh, wow. Um, I'm sure there is. Uh, you know, my, my attention has been on those two because they're the biggest fish in the sea. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, effectively you could do Siri uh, you could do some of the other platforms and there's some ones that you could, you could just code yourself. Um, but as far as the sophistication and the readiness to be able to write code for it, Google home and, and, uh, Amazon's Alexa are, are, are the way to go at this point. Awesome. Well, thank you much. Uh, are you, are you hanging out with us on the discord? Um, I unfortunately and comment back to the other. What's what's Wells Fargo's take on this? It's the um, Wells Fargo's take on this is that the serious game side is great, uh, and unfortunately, I have to go back and work for the bank because some of us have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, there's Ken's uh, Twitter as well as his email. If you all have any questions at all, uh, thank you very much for joining us, and then we'll be back in about five minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks all. It's a pleasure.